Hello, welcome to Companies Recovery, the podcast. I am Heather Jean, I am your host, and I am so excited to be talking in this episode with Suzanne Alexander. Um, and I'm especially happy because I completely messed up time zones and I really pride myself on understanding time zones because I'm a Canadian living in the UK. So I'm always like, I, I can do all the time zones off the top of my head. Um, but but apparently not. So I've learned something today as we're recording this. So let me tell you a little bit about Suzanne Alexander. Um, so Suzanne's business is Mindful Finances. And Suzanne works with women in business who are financially overwhelmed. Uh, and I'm laughing because we've got lots to talk about there. Um, and who, uh, who are looking to uncover their money blocks to transform their relationship with money so that they can build wealth confidently in all aspects of their life. Welcome, Suzanne. Thank, Thank you for being here. <laughs> no worries. It's so wonderful to be here with you. <laughs> it's um it's it's such an important topic and I'm so glad for the timing when this is when this is going to go up because I think a lot of times people get to like the end of the year and then they start making these business plans. And then in January it's like, okay, I've got to go, go, go. And it's a bit like New Year's resolutions. We start off strong and then try and willpower our way through the whole thing. How is that different to the work that you do? Yeah, look, it, from my perspective, you know, with regard to the financial financial side, so often we will set goals and we've got all these great aspirations and it's, it's really around the structure. What structure do you put in place to be able to achieve those goals? And from a financial mindset perspective, it's in a similar fashion. It's looking at what is the structure, what's the foundations that you're putting in place. So from a, a mind, well, from the mindful finances point of view, which is financial coaching, really delving into what are the beliefs, the thoughts, the behaviours that have come up and are really, I guess, guiding you on how you behave and how you interact. And it's just not with money. So quite often people or my clients will present and they're thinking it's actually a money issue and it's actually what is a money block. So it's usually something that comes up historically, you know, whether it's from childhood because most of our beliefs, thoughts, behaviours are sort of set by the age of eight. And so it's really understanding what that foundation is and going, okay, well, what's the foundation now? Where are you now? Same with goal setting. Where are you now? Where do you want to be? And how do we action that to get to there? So it's really exploring that further. Wow. So a lot of a lot of it is going back through our beliefs and our internal dialogue and, and sort of subconscious or unconscious blocks. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So yeah. So how our parents behave when we're children in relation to or the attitude of money yeah. and scarcity or, you know, what, what it means or all of those kind of things, yeah. they're forming our view yeah. of money. Absolutely. And so a lot of people don't realize this because we all think, you know, it's one of these funny things. Everyone feels that they're, me they're meant to be really good with money but we don't actually have any formal education. So formally here in Australia, we didn't have education around money in schools. You know, one of the big banks would come in and, you know, they'd set up bank accounts and most people still have those bank accounts. I'm one of those. You know, it, it's sort of this association. I can't let it go because I've had it since childhood. But in terms of actual financial education, the financial education we get is predominantly through family members, extended family, community, school teachers. And so if you think about it, when we're growing up, so up until about the age of eight, so seven or eight, we have what is called the subconscious mind. And that's where we're really absorbing our thoughts, our beliefs. You know, it's what we are visually seeing, what we're hearing. And so we're interpreting whatever our parents, community, extended family are doing and then taking that almost for fact. And then it's only from, pay, you know, from age eight onwards where we, we develop the, the conscious mindset, which is more log logical and rational thinking. Do we start going, well, is this right or is this wrong? Because we're comparing against what our maybe, you know, whether it's the community, whether it's, um, you know, your religion that you're involved with, whether it's the teachers that you're 
um, being taught by, you'll start hearing stories and that's when we start to choose our beliefs. Are they more in line with someone we're speaking with now or are we taking on the belief of what we grew up with, which is normally from a, a family perspective? And so that's why we say you end up actually choosing your beliefs subconsciously from a very young age and unless you do further work around it it actually becomes ingrained yeah and we're we're also kind of under the impression that like our learning stops when we're done school mm -hmm. like so so we learned or mastered whatever we needed to mm -hmm. and then and then we go off and practice it and yeah and no nobody ever sort of says this isn't done yet you know you have to keep re-examining it you have to keep uncovering it and re-choosing it because, you know, even because I was going to ask you what what's the ideal way to to instill the right mindset for your children's money beliefs. Yeah. But really how your children are as adults, the economy will be different. So, I mean, like, you know, we couldn't have predicted COVID. We, yeah. you know, th there were there were so many that when my parents were raising me, they couldn't have predicted the Internet, you know, so. Like there isn't really an ideal thing where, you, you know, your parents raise you in exactly the right way. So you have the exact ideal beliefs. You've yeah. got to do the work yourself and nobody tells you that. Yeah, absolutely. And that comes back to the better that you understand money, the more open that you're going to be. So one of the things that, you know, I speak about is, you know, with children, be as open as possible about money. Because if, if you're struggling with money and then you're giving them perception that you're wealthy, then, you know, they're getting the wrong interpretation. So they're going to just expect a level of gift and that just puts undue financial stress on yourself to maintain that. So when things are tight, I mean, there's there's a balance with everything, you know, you know, from what we eat and what we do, you know, um, even how we work, you know, having that self-care aspect. But with money, there is an opportunity just to explain, well, you know, things are a little tight at the moment, you know, just so that and um, that they understand too that there is going to be times in their life when, you know, there could be financial hurdles that have to be overcome. So it's teaching them from a young age. Also getting children to sort of start saving so actually giving them pocket money one of um the things that comes up quite regularly with a lot of my clients is they weren't taught money or they weren't given pocket money when they were younger and yes it, it could be that they can't you know parents can't afford to give them pocket money but it's a great way to start teaching them the responsibility of money and the physical side of money so you you mentioned you know Absolutely. I mean, here in Australia, especially with COVID, we have been pretty much um, advised to use pay by plastic. So debit card or credit card, because we don't want to be touching money at the moment. And so that will change because they're really moving. Governments are moving towards a cashless society, one, so they can track it all through the tax system. But two, you know, with the transaction of money, it's you know, there's there's a lot that goes into the production of money and costs of actually producing physical, tangible money. But whilst we can, it's actually teaching kids, well, this is what money is. This is the value of money. And even I remember doing, you know, when I grew up, you know, washing the car, I'd get like $2. <laughs> you know, having little tasks that associate with, okay, well, if, if you are doing work, then there is money is an exchange of energy it's also an exchange of value so when you're you're doing something uh, getting children to understand from a young age there is an exchange now there's also again another balance to that which is there's not you know you don't want to cause this level of expectation everything you do has to be rewarded there are some opportunities where you do something and the reward is just seeing the happiness or just doing it because you want to do it absolutely absolutely yeah. you were just you, when you were saying that i was thinking i could never have prepared my children for cryptocurrency for example yeah because that is like makes my head explode um and it's it it's not even money's in your bank and you use your plastic to get it out instead of paper money to mm. get it out right it's, yeah. it's it's never a physical thing so it it just is the perfect illustration that 
it's an exchange of of energetic mm. um you know, but so what happens to people who have money blocks and then try and start a business right so they're mm. they're there doing the do mm. expecting an exchange of money back maybe they've had a job before maybe that's how they were raised mm. and then it doesn't come and then we say there are money blocks yeah so there's there's so many levels to that but let's focus on the fact that or, or one you know side of that is to, when so say you're starting a business we're going to start with a new business owner and say you're transitioning and so you've got your full-time job and you're going right I've got my side business that I'm going to slowly build up over time and I've worked with clients around this which is you know they're like, I'm, you know, this business is going to be fantastic. I'm going to go full time. I'm going to earn lots of money in this business, but they're actually not charging anyone. And so the money block is, but I'm earning my income in my full time job. It's covering my expenses. Why do I need to actually start earning money here? Mm-hmm. And so one of the things I talk to clients about, um, and I recently spoke about on social media is, is are you running a charity or are you running a business? And so it's having this mindset and there's no right or wrong as long as you're aware. So it's having this mindset and understanding there could be a block around where actually I'm running a charity, you know, and that could come from underlying beliefs, you know, without sort of understanding that you're running a charity, but that could come from underlying beliefs as I'm not worthy enough. Um, you know, I have to work hard and maybe because it's not your full-time business, you're not associating working hard. So you're, you're almost pulling back and going, well, I'm not quite ready to be paid because really I haven't gone full-time. And, you know, especially from a female perspective, we focus on getting everything so perfect. So unless it's, you know, if, if it's not 100% perfect or 99% perfect, we can't charge for it. Instead of taking the attitude, which is there's still an exchange of value, what I bring to the table is still more often than not more than what the party is on the other side of the exchange. So it's having that self-belief, which is again comes from a money block usually associated with I'm not worthy of money or, um, you know, money's hard to get. And so those sort of money blocks come into the frame and you know you reinforce it because you're not asking for money or you may have difficulty talking about money if money wasn't freely and openly talked about in the family environment when you were growing up yeah and it's interesting because um for some people it's it's even about the amount like mm-hmm. i'm happy to charge for it but i can't charge you know 5000 for it yeah. or whatever the the money is you know it's 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 about that that value i'm used to being paid x amount and now i'm supposed to ask for more because that's what the market will hold Mm. and then there's all these coaches that are saying um i can't afford it is never a real objection it it Mm. is like some people literally cannot like they they physically don't have the money to transfer to you yeah it, it's interesting you say that, and you're right. There are some people that cannot afford it. One, you know, what I have seen with working with clients and even experiencing it, you know, through my own work in the finance industry, is that if you attribute a strong enough value, then you will find a way of getting the money. And the reason I say this is, you know, recently I was in conversation with a prospective, you know, in, um, individual to work with and I was speaking with them in my mindset. I was like, okay, you're living week to week. How about I, you know, provide some recommendations around a couple of books because in my, and again, you know, still working, we all constantly working on our own beliefs. In my mindset, I was going, but you can't work, you can't afford to work with me just yet. Why don't we just work on some, you know, um, I guess, sort of other areas and then get to that point that you're ready. And then the next week I heard that she went off with another coach And that's fine because it was in an area, it was different to the area that I was working in. And 
it was more awakening to me to remind me that when your values are strong enough and it's really one understanding what your values are and if it aligns with what your values are then you really will find this you know a money to sort of step up and do that so it's being mindful not to always use that as a block and it, it's it's not until you probably go through that sort of process that it really resonates home and you go well actually if I just put it out there, it's up for them to understand and, you know, work out whether it aligns to their values. And if you understand the individual's values when you're talking to them, it's a perfect opportunity to see if there's an alignment there. Because some people are so um, caught up with, you know, what so say in the finance arena you know I, I get a number of people that come and broad spectrum of people that really in you know dire situation where they are living week to week and then the other end of the spectrum and you can't judge either side of whether they can or can't afford it because it really comes down to the values because the person who could afford it if it doesn't align to their values they're still not going to spend the money yeah so from a you know business perspective it's being broader, you know, in your thinking and understanding actually values will drive more of the decision than actually having the physical, tangible money available to pay for it. Yeah, absolutely. And I'd say particularly if it's a business transaction, mm. I think it's um, there's a billionaire in Canada who um, talks a lot about, you know, his parents being really broke and there being a door-to-door -door vacuum sale salesperson and in the UK people would talk about you know double glazing salespeople that were just high pressure and they you know all these stories of I will sleep on your sofa until you yeah. decide to buy kind of thing right so we're not talking about that high pressure stuff no. we're, we're, we're talking about a business transaction and if what you're uh, offering is if, if I believe that that is what I need if it, and if it is a, aligned properly yeah then I'm going to put effort into it because we've all bought programs that we didn't mm. use. I mean, yeah. it makes me crazy how many programs I've not, you know what I really wanted it at the time and then never, never did it yeah. and or never finished it or never, you know, never applied it or lots of things like that. And I think, I think if, if you really don't have the money for something mm. like really don't, and you find the money, you will find the energy and focus to make yeah. that pay for itself quickly. Yeah. And look, some of that is, and I, you know, I put it into practice, which is sometimes when, you know, there's say a course that I'm really wanting to do and I'm like, really does, you know, maybe it's not aligned to what I planned, but I'm like, right, well, if, if this certain transaction goes ahead, then, then I'll go ahead and do the course. And quite often that will happen and then I'll go ahead with the course and do the course. But so sometimes it's also like looking at it from a perspective of almost manifesting, you know, money to be able to drive that because it's amazing from an energetic perspective. You know, we are essentially energy, you know, we're physically, you know, we're only about 1%. Um, the rest of us is energy and that's why I talk about the energetic exchange of money. And so quite often when something really aligns to your values and you're really wanting to proceed with that. And 100%, I agree with you, it's nothing to do with door-to-door -door sales or high-pressure selling. I'm not, you know, an advocate or I don't encourage that. But if it aligns to your values and you really resonate about that, and even if you're thinking about it days on, you'll usually find a way of being able to, you know, go, okay, well, maybe, you know, I do a Marie Kondo effect on my house. I go through and I sell some items or, you know, go and mow some lawns or, you know, there are other little other side hustles or you might, you know, may manifest money and money may come in, you know, from, you know, money you've either loaned to people or, you know, suddenly, um, you know, you get a windfall because, premiums or something has changed on insurance and you get a, a credit back or you've overpaid on you know certain items so um it's it's using different areas of finance not just physically I've got to go to work and earn an income where can we think outside the square because again that's that money block which is oh I only earn money through working hard 
And yeah. it doesn't always necessarily need to be that way. Okay, talk to me about your definition of manifesting money. Yeah, so manifesting money is, it is literally being focused on what you want to achieve and putting out there to the universe. So it's it's what you focus on is what you sort of achieve. So it's going, okay, well, you know, I want to do a, a course. And so I need X amount of money to be able to do this course. So I want to be able to manifest that amount of money so that I can go on and do this program. And so what you're focusing on then is, well, how do I create money to be able to build the funds to be able to say pay for that course and so for me it is one it's the focus it's also making sure my environment is aligning to being able to bring energetically money in so if you've got clutter everywhere then universally you're putting out there well you know where's the space that's coming in like where where can I come in if you're so distracted with everything else it's creating that space. It's clearing out anything that doesn't serve you and, you know, make you happy. It, it is in some ways a, a bit of a Marie Kondo effect so that energetically you can open up the space for opportunities to come in. And quite often that's happened with me. You know, I've done a, a clean out, you know, I've created a clearer space energetically and then, you know, I'll have, um, you know, connections come through that are wanting to work with me that I haven't been in touch with for three years. So it's an amazing opportunity. And, you know, even from that, you know, I've had, you know, notifications that, you know, I'm being paid certain amounts of money and it's like, well, I never expected this or an opportunity comes up um, to do, you know, side work. So sometimes I'll do a survey online and suddenly it comes up the next day in the inbox and it's like, oh, here's a survey to do and it's, you know, X amount of money. So it's it's energetically just putting the focus into what you're wanting to achieve. It's almost that law of attraction. Yeah, and that's where the blocks come in, I guess, with that, you know, if I don't believe I'm, I'm deserving of it or it's never going to work or what if I sell stuff and then I can't help people or then there's all those blocks. You're not allowing that flow to come in. Yeah. Yeah. So is it necessary that I have to say um, that I want a clear space so that I can attract um, the energy of money so that I can go on this course? Like, is it is it necessary that I'm planning what's going to go out as well as what's when it comes in? So um, oh, in terms of clearing the space? Yeah. 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 So if I want the course, then that's what I'm going to spend the money on. So I'm yeah. trying to attract it in yeah. order to spend it. Or because I, there's a lot of people talk about when I attract that, then I keep it all in a bank and then that doesn't work. Yeah. So if you're wanting, so sometimes it might be just saying, you know, to yourself, okay, I want, I'm wanting to do this course or whatever it is, you know, I'm wanting to buy this item and I'll, I'll allow myself to buy that on my item if I can manifest in this amount of money over the next, you might put a time frame over the next month or next week. If I can bring this money in, then I'm going to put it towards that course. One, because it's outside the normal range of what you're earning. So it's not like you're taking the money from your salary. It's actually additional money. And that's where that manifestation, I mean, manifestation can be used to actually, you know, increase you know, income or create job opportunities or, um, you know, it could be lifestyle opportunities. You know, I'd, I'd love to go on a yoga retreat and then suddenly there's a competition that comes up and you apply for and, you know, you win. So there's different ways of manifesting in terms of the creating space energetically. And I find that if I go into spaces where there's a lot of clutter energetically, I just feel drained. So if, you know, for me particularly, if my space is clean and I've got a, you know, working environment, whether, you know, it's lifestyle based or business based, then I know energetically I'm always um, operating at my highest potential. So it's allowing, I guess, from an energetic point of view, it's allowing the space for the energy to be able to, you know, move freely. That's really interesting because as we're recording this, it's holiday time. So a lot of people will have their 
their Christmas trees or decorations or things mm. up. I don't because I find it exhausting once the tree goes up. It's pretty for a day yeah. and then it's exhausting and I want it gone. Yeah. It just takes up too much space. And I, I have a, a pretty clear room um, where I work because I have a pole in the middle of the room because I do aerial pole. And so I have to have it clear all the way around. Yeah. Otherwise, I'll kick things. Um, so so I like that space. And that is the space where we'll use during the Christmas holidays. So I, I don't want a, a tree and decorations. And they're pretty. And yeah. yet it's really strange because it's like instantly hits me. Yeah. That, I'm, I'm feeling very confined. And I think we underestimate, not all of us, but a lot of us underestimate how much energy things around us absorb. Yeah. And that's the thing. Like you, you look at that and, it, you know, every item has sort of a level, especially any living item, but every item will have a form of energy to it. And it, it is amazing. Even when you walk into the room, it's being really mindful when you walk into your room, how do you feel? So I know with, you know, here in Australia, unfortunately, I'm in Melbourne, which is, you know, has just achieved the uh, world record for the, the most amount of days in lockdown, which is definitely not what we wanted. But, <laughs> you know, from a lot of people are working from home. And so it's creating an environment. A lot of people have gone, OK, well, we're only here for a short term. So when I moved in, um, I'm in my, you know, spare bedroom at the, um, where I've set up. When I first moved in, I had this tiny little desk and I was like, no, no, I'm fine. I'm fine. And it took about 12 months in and I'm like, oh, I think I might need a bigger desk. And I got this double, double the size desk and energetically, it was almost like a weight had been lift off, lifted off my shoulders because suddenly I've gone from this even though it didn't feel like it at the moment, it felt like this, to now I've got this space. And that's where I'm saying with energetically, it's it's how it um, how you absorb the environment that you're in also impacts on what you're focusing on. Because if you're sort of tense all the time, it's got to have an impact on how energetically, whether it's manifestation, law of attraction, you know, abundance, that abundance mindset, how you're taking that in. Yeah. And and then, you know, if you have a lot of clutter, it's it's starting to work out, is that maybe another block as well? Is that a scarcity mindset where potentially you have to hold on to everything because you've spent all this money rather than acknowledging, well, if it no longer serves me, then it's okay to let it go. And whether you donate it or whether you sell it, it's it's okay to let it go. I love watching the Marie Kondo stuff when, when people say, yes, but I paid for that. Yeah. And I might need it one day. Yes, you might. And you yeah. might even have to rebuy it one day if you let it go. Yeah. So we hold on to things and we don't realize how kind of oppressive it can be if there's if it if it goes past a certain balance yeah yeah um, yeah yeah I and so what is it, it what is it sorry go ahead I was just going to say you know I look I look at we, I've got a golden labrador Bella and um who I'm absolutely adore and whenever we go for a walk she's a complete ball hog but every time she goes she'll find a ball somewhere along the way she comes back and she brings it back but never looks at it. And so this is where I associate it with, you know, collecting items in your home. How often are you going to go back to that? And the reality is I look at, you know, even clothing, something that you had, yeah, it's starting to come back in style, but it it's tweaked. And so sometimes even though you've got a similar item, you still look at it and go, oh, it's not quite what they're selling now because fashion is cyclical that you end up still buying a new item anyway. Absolutely. So Absolutely. It's, it's just acknowledging. One of the, the things I do a lot with money, and Ken Honda has a great book, Happy Money, um, and it is acknowledging money when it goes in and out. So it's arigato, which is thank you, sort of in, 
So arigato out, which is when you're handing money away, and then arigato in, which is when you're receiving money. So it's just being a bit more mindful around when you're giving and receiving money from an energetic point of view and just acknowledging, yeah, I'm grateful that I'm able to, you know, be able to exchange this money and pay for this item. And, yes, I'm grateful for when I receive money, you know, whether it's salary or, as I said, off-the-cuff money that comes in or gifts, you know, when you're gifted money, um, as a birthday or Christmas present, especially coming into Christmas, it's being really grateful of the opportunity to either receive or be able to give that money. Yeah, that's beautiful. So what is the biggest money block that you come across? It is scarcity mindset. So it is this, and and I, I say that because it's also one that I experienced. So for years I was told money is hard to work for you know, it had to come by and you've got to work hard for your money. And so I carried that through, you know, it wouldn't be unusual for me to work a 12, 13 hour day, if not longer and go, okay, that's, that's what it is. That's what you do because you've got to work hard for your money. And uh, it wasn't until a recent health scare, my husband was diagnosed uh, with cancer earlier this year that I really hit home and went, this isn't right. Plus, I'd been noticing in the finance space, there's a real disparity between, you know, helping clients either pay down debt or build wealth. And then suddenly they were back in, you know, if it was a debt um, situation, they went back into debt. And so I knew that there was a psychological aspect there. And so when I delved into the financial coaching, I explored my own beliefs that were coming up. And for me, it was the finance scarcity and which I see with a lot of clients which is a real fear of letting go and really holding on and a lot of the language is used you know oh no I can't do that because I can't afford it you know oh that's too expensive um and even from a business owner's perspective it's also the scarcity in mindset comes into how you value yourself with regard to how you're charging, how you value yourself in terms of building your knowledge and so spending on others. So with a scarcity mindset, you're like, oh, no, I've got to do it all myself. You know, I can't pay someone to help me. And suddenly you become so overwhelmed and you're trying to take on everything that you're not an expert at. So that scarcity mindset comes in and really blocks you from being able to achieve that abundance because if you're actually focusing on what you really love doing and enjoying, and sure, in business there's, there's many aspects you, you don't entirely love but you can get through, but then there's some that you just need to outsource and get some assistance, whether it's web you know, development or copywriting or you know, even helping with course development. So that scarcity mindset is a massive one that comes in. And what a lot of people don't understand is with the scarcity mindset, it's the language that's used because quite often they'll be putting off clients when they're speaking about scarcity, like they're talking about a program. So say, for example, you're trying to talk to a client about a program that you've got on offer, but then you're going, oh, yeah, but that is so expensive. So suddenly, you know, you're talking about, you might be talking about, um, something else in the context, as soon as you've gone, that's so expensive, suddenly you've put in the individual's mind, oh, well, that's expensive. That's a ben You've just suddenly set a benchmark. Yeah. And so it's being really aware of how that comes into because it impacts not only your relationship with money, relationship with clients, but it's family, it's friends, it's partners, it's it's that language it's 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 almost like you're cringing all the time because you're in constant fear of having to let go or you feel that you know when you give money and you might struggle with giving money because you're constantly thinking you know that takes me so much work hard work mentality to you know hand over money instead of going actually I feel privileged to be able to give that money to you because I can earn money this is so on a parallel, like I'm, I'm feeling quite emotional right now because it's on such a parallel to the work that I do around physical body confidence. And you know, that, 
that difference between you know how I look and feel today and how I want to look and feel and you're they can both exist you know I but that physical shrinking that you know that apologizing we might not use language around you know that's expensive but we'll we'll certainly you know be apologetic yeah. and you know that we, we don't have the same connection with eye contact and, so, and then we wonder why people don't trust us and want to buy from us you know? yeah and 100 percent because eye contact is a really strong way of building trust like if you're not you know and and i i know you know um you know, with some people, they struggle with being able to maintain eye contact. And and that makes it a little bit more difficult because eye contact, people being able to see, again, it's a bit of an energetic exchange, you know, looking into your eyes and people will say, oh, you know, you've, you've got, you know, a beautiful energy that comes up and, you know, your eyes sparkle or, you know, it, it's amazing how from a physical perspective, we will resonate with someone depending on how they hold their their body. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's 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 just it's incredible that how how many of our beliefs mm-hmm. are easily recognized and shifted, but we need support, and we and we're we're never really done. And I think that's what that's the difference for me. Other than you know my my corporate training business, which I've had for nearly twenty six years. And then my and and then my online business, which started in 2020, there I always thought it was the difference between you know one is physical in person and one is mm-hmm. online, one is business to consumer and one is business to business, and they're quite different. But actually, I, I I'm realizing in the last couple of months that it's more that when we do this kind of work, then we have to do the work, like we. Yeah. You, you can't do mindset and beliefs and support and you know really kind of confidence work without doing the work yourself mm. whereas i can go into a corporation and i can run team building or personality preferences or whatever you know i can do that without i i just need the the knowledge of it you know yeah. I, yeah. I, don't, I don't have to have done the work i don't have to have led a major corporation in order to be a leadership consultant you know it's that whereas when we get into this work it's a lot yeah and i think that a lot of people are not ready for that when they start taking on coaching clients or you know running online courses or those kind of things yeah and i look you know off the back of that too you you've got to be ready so when I work with a client they've got to be a hundred percent because we do delve deep there are a lot of emotions that come up and a lot of people because we're in a society that is so switched on we are becoming less connected with our emotions we're becoming disconnected with our emotions in actual fact coaching brings it back to actually getting more in touch with what are you emotionally what's coming up for you you know what have you felt like you know one of the exercises I work with is you know understanding what's the event and then what emotion is coming up for you and then you know is that you know benefiting you or how is that challenging you and is it really a true like is it true so it might you know might be something happens with around money and you're like oh i'm bad with money and it's like but are you really bad with money because you're really great with budgeting it's just that you just happen to spend maybe more than you expected on this item and then suddenly you walk past a shop and it's you know got 50 percent off it's not that you're bad with money it's just circumstantially you've just gone you've associated the connection there emotionally because of a past belief instead of going actually I'm really good with money it just happens to be that this shop has got 50% off and you know I I didn't go to that shop first so where do we where do we start with this i mean cuz presumably we don't kind of go oh i need a money mindset coach so i'm yeah. going to call Suzanne. it it's got to be it's got to be something where we start kind of realizing what's going on and then realizing that because it it, to me it's like a a, a personal trainer right Mm. we can all exercise by ourselves that's not an issue if you have a personal trainer you work harder (laughs) 
which again, you have to be ready or you're not going yeah. to show up. Um, and then you're just paying for nothing. So, ha so ha what's the work that c takes place or where can we start yeah. before we get to the point where we want or need a coach? Yeah, great. Great question because so a couple of questions as key takeaways to start asking yourself is what is my relationship with money? So what is your current relationship with money? So um, do you dislike money? Do you love money? Do you hold on to money? Do you freely give money away? Does money come in and yet yeah, you, you're holding on to it? Or do you find that money comes in and then suddenly as soon as it comes in, it goes out? So it's really, that's the first question, which is what is my relationship with money? The next question to ask yourself is what was my relationship or what was I taught around money when I was younger? So looking back and really starting to understand. So if you're looking from, you know, a, a family context, okay, well, what did my parents tell me about money or extended family teach me about money? What did I witness? And then how does that connect to how I'm playing out with money now? So it's really starting to go, where are you with money now? Where were you with money historically as a child? And which of those beliefs are you still playing out? And then understanding out of those, what you're playing out now, what's a challenge? What's challenging you? So never have any money. So that's a challenge. Okay, well, why don't you have that money? Well, my, my paycheck comes in and suddenly I, you know, I don't have any money, okay? So then we, we would then look at, okay, well, what is that money being spent on? And working out, well, does it align to your values? Because energetically also you might have this disconnect of, you know, money always goes out and I just, you know, really frustrated, which then starts to make you think, one, are you just not earning enough money to meet your expenses or are your expenses that you're spending your money on not really aligning to your values? So there's your day-to-day -day living expenses, but then there's additional lifestyle expenses. Are those lifestyle expenses in line with what your values are? So that's sort of that challenge. But the other is, okay, so money coming in, you know, but I don't go out. I don't go out for, you know, dinner. I don't go out for socialising. Um, I always feel like I don't have a mon enough money. I've got to hold on to that. So how is that benefiting you and how is that challenging you? Yeah. So it's really starting to work out at the core what's working. And it, if you feel like you've got a really good handle on finances, then you might be at a point that you don't need financial coaching. You know, so I always attribute, so having worked as a financial advisor for nearly eight years, and one of the key things I saw as part of that is this real disconnect between clients coming in and it was almost like they handled over control. And one of the big things I want to do is empower women, especially is to actually step up and never lose that control. It's, it's having the financial knowledge and understanding around why you spend and why you make the decisions you do, even around how much money you earn, you know, from a salary perspective or how much you charge, you know, it's it's having that ownership of that so that no matter whether you're single or in a relationship, no matter what happens, you've always got that confidence of knowing that you can take care of yourself. So it's really starting to understand, well, where where is your relationship right now and if you are finding that you're really experiencing challenges a lot of clients i'm working with at the moment are finding challenges around pricing in their business so it's really you know working around what's come up and a lot of again it comes back a lot of the beliefs have been um embedded in that subconscious mind stage up until you know age seven that you know beliefs that you've witnessed or seen have ingrained and are now stopping you from actually moving forward. So growing your business. So say from a business, I work with a lot of business women, so growing your business. 
then you might go, okay, well, I understand this part. What are my challenges? What are the benefits of what I'm experiencing? And where did those beliefs come from? But I just don't know how to take it to the next level, which is really where we delve deep into sort of identifying. and, And that's where, you know, the fear of success, you know, will quite often come up. And once that you know, is able, whatever it is, whatever the underlying belief that's holding you back comes out, you can just see that weight just drop. And it's like, ah, you know, for some people, it might be a comment that a family member made, like when they were six, and they hadn't even realized. And suddenly through questioning and coaching, we're able to pull that out. And as soon as there's acknowledgement of that, then that comment just, it, it, it just brings a sense of relief. That they've gone, oh, my gosh, yeah. They've attached so much of their life to that and it could be 20, 30 years down the track. So that's then where you would then move into a space of going like a financial, um, like a personal trainer, which is you start off, you work out, are you making any improvements? And if you're not, then engaging a financial coach to go, how do I um, take this to another level? You know, how do I set, more um, positive habits because that's what financial coaching is it's actually working with clients to understand what the goals are what their vision is and then really delving into what's the beliefs the thoughts the behavior that's currently supporting where you want to go and how would would we make that more positive to be able to achieve those bigger goals Beautiful. That was a long answer. So sorry about that. (laughs) I love that. I know. I think it's important, though, for people to kind of be able to recognize, like, how do I know if I need a financial coach? What do we do? Uh, You know, so doing that kind of groundwork and then recognizing. And I love that we've made this be a little bit like fitness. You know, um, that you you do what you can, and if you're not making progress, then then you get somebody else to kind of help you. Um, And it's it it's such an important topic mm. because we all need money which is why i'm so excited to have you here and you know and really sometimes like you say if we uncover those blocks and then we find out it wasn't even that i was just afraid yeah. of success so i was sabotaging my success by not charging enough or not selling or whatever yeah. so it it it's it, it makes complete sense for me and i i think um you know you've given us some really good questions for um, to uh, to kind of lay as groundwork to know, do I need to reach out and, um, and and learn more about this? Yeah, and look, there's some you know great books out there. Uh, I actually studied coaching with the Money Panel by Catherine Morgan uh, in the UK. So a lot of my calls are you know with the UK. We're doing the financial coaching. I know she's just released a book, um, but it, it's really starting to delve financial coaching is fantastic if and it's like the you know personal trainer if you want to take it to the next level and I know even from my own experience having come from a scarcity mindset I wouldn't have been able to experience the transformation that I've experienced through financial coaching because it it's almost like doing exercise at home and and suddenly you're like oh yeah I'm 20 minutes in I'll probably just go off and do something. Whereas a personal trainer, they do make you work harder. And that's where the financial coaching comes in because just where that discomfort comes in, they're going to be there to support you and guide you and really nurture you through that. And that's where the real transformation starts to come. That's so beautiful. And that's that sounds so much nicer than a personal trainer who will not be there to nurture you. No. <laughs> to push you. Trust me, I've, I've, I've been there. Okay, so uh, I could talk about this all day. This feels like <laughs> therapy to me. I need to go away and, and just kind of play with those questions because I know where my beliefs have come from. Mm-hmm. I did the work of healing from my own parental stuff and my father's still alive and he still uses those language patterns. And I have to stop mm-hmm. and say, you, you, yeah, I need to stop you there. You can't, you can't say this stuff to me anymore. Cause I, I can't, I can't, the, the voices, the pattern is really ingrained. So be really yeah. quick to go back in. Um, and then, and then I did not maintain control over my finances because I had a very successful business and my late husband uh, had Alzheimer's and did a lot of things that mm-hmm. we didn't know mm-hmm. and had over 70 bank accounts. Mm. seven zero more than 
Um, so, uh, <laughs> so that's a that's a whole other podcast. Yeah. How did you move from finance to financial, you know, coaching and mindset stuff? Like what, what? Because they seem quite different. One is like, yes. you know, strategic and 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 by the way, I think a lot of women, not all, but a lot of women and and mostly women would rather just go. Here's my money. You fix it and make it yeah. work. Like, you and, know. and a lot do. Yeah, and it it's it's really you know it's funny you should say that and. Quite often when, you know, women used to come to me, it's like, okay, you know, ultimately we want you to have the power to get this set up. So it's being, and that's where I, I really transition. So uh, I've been in finance for 15 years. I worked as a financial advisor for about eight years. And then, as I mentioned, my husband was diagnosed with cancer earlier this year. And so I decided to step away from financial coaching, but I'd always had this inkling that something was missing. I'd, I'd spoken, you know, to my workplace that, you know, I wanted to do more education around, with women um, around finances, empowering them. And also I felt that there was a disconnect between what we were doing and really getting to understand what was driving the behaviour for the clients. And that's where financial coaching, I came across the financial coaching, which ties really heavily into the behavioural finance that I had an interest in. And so really delving into that, which is more of the psychology of money. And it's it is it's the psychology. It's so you could you could almost say that financial coaching is counselling, or you know, you're going to a psychologist, but you're focusing around money. And it's funny because it's not essentially about money. It usually comes back to some underlying belief that you've attached to money, and that's where the feelings come in. It's almost like when you go shopping, and depending on your emotional state, will determine how much you spend as well, because. Our emotions actually have a far greater impact on how we actually play out our lives and not just money in so many other areas. So from from there, it, I just really delved into that and I just love coaching women. I love seeing the transformation and, and working with, you know, so many women that have they either doubled their pricing or they've gone from zero pricing because they've been working with a charity mindset to suddenly really starting to grow their business into what they actually imagined it to be. So that's been transformational, but also giving the power back to women to actually go, well, actually I can own this. So whilst I may not overly enjoy it, I'm across it that I know that if something is out, or, you know, I can identify what's going on. So it's really building back the confidence. And, and I guess taking, taking a step back, when my husband was diagnosed, for me, one of the thoughts after processing his diagnosis was, well, I don't have to worry about our finances, but what about all of those people and especially women that are going through a similar situation that now have not only the stress their partner and in some cases may, the main breadwinner is, um, you know, in a position that they may not be able to work, but their finances are, they one, they may not have any clue around fine at the finances or they're in a complete disarray. And I thought, you know, I'm in this position that, you know, I'd recently reviewed all of our, you know, insurances. I do a monthly health check, and it's it's really getting women on the same page to go, you can have that control back and that confidence back. It doesn't take much. It's just it's the knowledge. You've just got to build the knowledge. Like, you know, going back to the personal trainer, you know to know what to do and understand why you're doing it to then be able to take that and put it in practice in, you know, everyday life. That's so different than going to a financial planner who tells you what to do and where to invest it and, and you never really understand how it works for yourself. Um, yes, yeah, so they're, they're very much more, and, you know, financial coaches can work with goals and, and your vision as well. Financial advisors will understand your goal and go, right, this is how we do it. But I find that there's not as much, you know, understanding of why are you behaving the way that you're behaving and and really delving more which I find much more transformational because if you can change that suddenly you might have someone who does have challenging spending habits that constantly get dead into debt understanding why they do that could stop that cycle immediately yeah 
Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. We are, our lives are so similar. You know, I always talk about, it's not what you eat, it's why you eat. It's like, yeah. you know, it's, they're very similar and it's, it's, it's just so refreshing to hear that, you know, money isn't a taboo subject and it isn't something yeah. that we, you know, are really just kind of stuck with. Um, and I think that before we had the internet and access to um, money mindset coaches, we, we kind of were just stuck with that, you know, that, yeah. was, that was a lot. Yeah. And that's the thing. I think, you know, for some people too, reading a book can actually be quite overwhelming. So yeah. some financial coaches will actually do the education side. Some will just focus on coaching and it's finding a coach that actually works to what you're wanting to achieve and, and really also making sure you interview coaches because you've got to resonate. It's, it's, it's a really personal environment that you're going into and you're going to, you know, with all of my sessions, a lot of personal history comes up and you've got to feel comfortable being open with that. So and that's where we talk about, you know, being ready to go into that, that if you feel like you're working with someone that provides a really safe environment, you're more open to exploring what's holding you back. And that's where the transformation comes in. So being really open if you are wanting to work with a coach. That's such good advice. That is such mm -hmm. good advice rather than just handing it over to somebody. Yeah. Well, the transformation doesn't come if you don't do the work and the work comes from you being open to exploring. And and sometimes there's a lot of emotions that come up, you know, not all, you know, everyone has lived a rosy childhood. So it's being open and, and being prepared to sort of explore what those emotions that come up that could be, you know, a form of block in your body that's holding you back from so many different areas. As we're talking, I'm thinking, I know my children's money blocks already. They don't, but I can hear it. <laughs> yeah. And that, isn't it amazing when you start being more attuned in that space? I, even when I listen to conversations when, you know, I'm speaking with people or even in the supermarket and, you know, I listen and I watch people's habits and I'm like, ah, oh, yes, yeah, I, I, I've got an idea of what your blocks are. Interesting. Mm. Interesting. My, my, my children will have seen uh, a real range, but most especially I think their money blocks will come from the fact that they went to school with very very wealthy people or wealthy children of wealthy families and so i think they will which which is quite ridiculous but i think they will consider themselves to have been quite poor when they were growing up even though they were in some of the best schools in in in, in the, the countries that they went to schools in yeah um and it's it's interesting because there's a comparison of you know, I, I can still I can still remember my daughter being like 12 and crying because her best friend got a horse for Christmas. And that wasn't, you know, why can't she have a horse for Christmas? You know, that kind of thing. And because uh, they, they went to school in the Middle East. And, you know, it's that kind of thing where you just think, wow, OK, I can hear your money blocks because you're yeah. always going to be. I was the poor one. You know, mm -hmm. we we didn't have a helicopter to pick us up from concerts, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so and being aware of that because, and you know, poor for someone, and, and you, you, you're explaining this so well, poor for someone is, is entirely different. So, you know, I, I know, you know, when I speak with clients, there sometimes can be a disconnect when they talk about money because of the environment they've grown up on, grown up in. And so it doesn't matter whether if you've come from a poor environment, it's, it's like, you look at some people that have just done extremely well and they've come from an exceptionally poor environment and vice versa, you know, they may have come from an affluent, affluent family, done really well, or they've come from an affluent family and they've not done great at all. Yeah. It's really how you've perceived the environment that you've grown up in and what you've, you've been given and taught. Absolutely. Mm. absolutely it's interesting it is it is so individual and this is why we need coaches like you to be able to work through our own things mm. and not and not just a generalization books are great um courses are great but i think when when you can really get into your own personal situation 
because you can hide in a group, right? Yeah. You, you don't yeah. want to do the work. I mean, so for me, group working is great because I, mm -hmm. I feed off of the energy of others. But but if, if you don't want to do the work, you can hide mm -hmm. and then and still complete the whole thing and then say, well, I've tried, but yeah. did you? Like, it's really about doing the work. And that's why I love the the, the methods that you're describing and, and the way that you do your work. Yeah, it, it's one of those things that I find, uh, especially at the moment, the mindset work is almost, you know, to really delve deep, it is that one on one relationship to really go in because even in a group environment, you can ask these questions. But unless you're really in tune with that individual and can just keep almost chipping away just subtly to sort of keep delving, that's where that transformation comes in. Whereas if you're in a group environment, um, it it can also it can sort of be higher level because you know yourself you won't. It's like with the you know the exercise. Oh, I'm not going to push myself too much. <laughs> um, it's the same when you're really starting to go internally. Uh, unless you're really intuitive, then you may just hit this what I call as a block where you don't know, but in actual fact you do, because a lot of the answers are within us. We just, we've hit a block and we just need some assistance to actually overcome that block. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. I'm thinking of all of the times I've hidden in the back of exercise groups. <laughs> <laughs> we all have, <laughs> I can assure you. <laughs> oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. Uh, okay. So I have a few questions, Suzanne, sure. just to give us a little bit of a flavor about you just before we wrap up um, in the context of cabaret. So um, cabaret for anybody who is new or listening for the, the, and isn't aware of what cabaret is. Um, for me, cabaret is is traditionally in a small venue with a small live audience. So obviously there have been cabaret shows during lockdown online. It's a little bit different. Um, obviously there are cabaret shows in huge theaters. Dita Von Tees is a burlesque performer who you know performs to thousands and thousands. Um, but traditionally, cabaret is something that's in a small audience. So any uh, comedians who were starting out, unless they had, uh, they were they were born into a family of famous people. Uh, you know, people like Bette Midler talk about you know being being um, performing in cabarets. Uh, you know, working their way up and 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 so on. Um, it so it can be um, it can be spoken, it can be singing, it can be comedy, it could be uh, contortion acts, it could be aerial acts. Uh, it could be burlesque, which is uh, my own preference. It could be drag kings or queens. Uh, it could be all kinds of different things in a small, intimate environment. If you were performing cabaret, Suzanne Alexander, what would you be performing? Oh, gosh. Um, I think it would be singing now i can't sing to save myself but i just i think am it's i hearing that... yourself limiting the leaps going on there yeah that... i know i am <laughs> everybody can sing <laughs> so yeah just to sing on stage i think I, I i keep you know um seeing these amazing singers with this you know beautiful these beautiful voices um and it's it's, it's just almost you know the commanding of the stage but i think i'd go singing even right. let me outside my comfort zone. <laughs> and, and any particular kind of style or genre that you would be singing? Would it be sort of slow? Would it be kind of fast? Yeah, it would be the slow. Like it would be um, Celine Dion style. <laughs> okay. All right. Okay. All right. Okay. I love you name dropping little Canadian stuff in there. All right. <laughs> okay. Um, and you can take one prop, and since you're going to be singing, you, there's a, it's a given that you have a microphone. What one prop would you take besides a microphone on stage? A piano. Oh, yeah. do you play? I used to play as a child, and I've actually, you know, I've been thinking maybe I need to get back into playing, but a beautiful black grand piano, yes. Yeah, I run uh, candlelight shows with uh, um, Ionaldi, um, who's a, an, an Italian uh, composer, uh, and the pieces are played on this 
beautiful piano. They bring the piano in every time and they tune it all for the pianist. And it is almost impossible not to touch it. It makes me mm. crazy because it's so sh I just, I, I, I used to play the piano too. I, I just, I, I wouldn't dare play it, but yes. it's just compelling. I love it. We, we had a Christmas party on Friday night and in the room was this black grand piano. And I just kept sort of going over. I'm like, I'm not going to touch it, but it was like, oh, how beautiful is this? I'd love to be able to just sit down and just be able to play fluently. <laughs> Amazing. Amazing. Okay, and one last question about this. Yes. And this is kind of where I'm going with the whole thing. What are you, is your stage name? So you're about to go on stage and sing like Celine Dion and play oh. the piano. And your stage name is, welcome to the stage. Oh, <laughs> you already know um, the answer to this. Oh, you you've heard really it. stopped me there. Yeah, you've stumped me there. Um, um, uh, you, you, you know. If you think about it, you'll, you'll know it. There is, there is a voice inside of us, and I'll just talk about this a little bit for listeners yeah, who haven't. Um, I'm intrigued played this game before and so a lot of times when when we hear a question like that we think oh okay so my my conscious brain is kicking in right and yeah. i need to think of something that's clever or something that's you know going to be attractive or uh you know so, some sort of you know funny plan words or whatever it is um and i can't possibly say that i'm i don't know queen alex do you know i can't like it, that's way too grand for me like i can't possibly tell you that that's what i would call myself so 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 it's um and so we try and you know consciously work it out right in our rational brain and what i'm talking about is that inner knowing what i'm talking about is that voice that says i I'm about to go on stage and sing like Celine Dion playing a grand piano mm -hmm. and I am somebody. And that energy inside of us is the energy that is fierce, fearless, strong, um, and, and is just so alive. And it is such a different energy than the energy we've been talking quite a lot about, which is that, you know, shrinking ourselves and, you know, limitations and, you know, just struggling and, you know, not enough, all of those kind of energies. And sometimes that's for those of us who experience imposter syndrome, that's our imposter voice coming up that is trying to keep us safe. Yeah. And I'm talking about the voice in you that doesn't give a damn, that is completely safe and to hell with it. I'm getting like Susie's Susie Shazam. Like <gasps> Susie Shazam. Please welcome to the stage. Susie Shazam. Love that. Yes. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> because you know what? Susie Shazam does not give a damn about what yeah. everybody else thinks and it it is that fierce energy and for me a lot of my work is around connecting to that energy mm. when we need to yeah and it's not fake it till you make it it's yeah. ignite and engage with that energy when we need it it's funny you say that i remember doing uh, an exercise and it, um, I had shape like shaking, shaking it like Shakira or shaking Shakira as like a, a name. And that's just brought that back up. And I went, you know, it is that same Shazam or Shakira. It's just that whole embodiment and confidence of going out and just doing what you want and being able to express yourself, like you said. But yeah, the, the underlying thing is that confidence and that empowerment to be able to to be so yeah thank you that was that was really interesting you really had me stumped <laughs> yeah and but what's interesting though is that there is a little voice going i'm here I'm yeah here. yeah and that's why i said you know it you do yeah. know it yeah you know yeah. because there there is that but i'm here i'm just not very loud yeah but when we can tune into that that voice will just take us wherever we want to go yeah and it's interesting because you know it's like that block until you sort of you know you were mentioning oh yeah you give the context behind that and you provide the space then the block seems to dissolve because we do know a lot of this 
you know, it is within us. But, yeah, thank you for liberating her. <laughs> That's beautiful. And you can talk to her. I mean, I, I talk to myself and I, I physically have more strength when I kind of go, oh, yeah, I just can't do this. And then, yeah. I, and then when I talk to myself in that other voice, then I'm physically stronger. Yeah. You know, and I'm like, no, you know what? I can totally do this. I've yeah. got this. I can climb that pole or jump that fence or, or, or lift that box or whatever it is. And it's that energy that I'm tuning into. It's not the, oh, I'm really tired. I'm like, well, I think um, Beyonce, doesn't she? She has a stage name and, and she just takes on that persona. As soon as she works on, walks on stage, it's just like I'm this person and that's where all the sass comes from. And yeah. and then she goes, when I'm not in that space, she goes, I'm like a completely different person. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And I work, you know, in, in doing cabaret, I, I work a lot with uh, with drag queens and drag kings and, mm. and they take on it's they describe it as the best of themselves mm -hmm. because they get to be all the things that, that they struggle to embrace and of course we it's not separate yeah it's yeah. not that we put on a costume or makeup or s shoes or whatever it is i wear nine inch heels on stage oh and wow i am fierce but mm -hmm. i have learned because i thought i needed to put the heels on i didn't yeah I can tap into that energy anytime I want. Mm. And it's that. Yeah. It, it's in your mind being able to visualize that. And that in itself is transformational. And it's Susie Shazam. Yeah. Ooh, like Celine Dion. <laughs> and Susie, Susie doesn't apologize. Susie takes up space. I love it. <laughs> That's fabulous. Thank you so much for being here and for sharing. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Thank this you. Is like, it's been amazing. I don't edit podcasts. I don't. I don't edit podcasts because I. I don't. I don't want to. I. I feel like whatever happens and you know whatever goes on. Half the time the dog is climbing on my lap or found a squeaky toy and the whole thing. I don't. I don't worry about all of that. Um, but at one stage I was thinking, yeah, this is going to go on for about two hours. <laughs> 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 your early morning and it's my late evening so we, really, we might need to do this again at some point um, oh i love that it's been so amazing to catch up and you oh after the day that you've had i'm hoping that you're not buzzing too much <laughs> I, I, I am going to do a really nice journal session yeah great before bed because i have had mm -hmm. lots of questions and when, when you're involved in the conversation instead of listening to it you you don't get to reflect on the questions but my body's going oh that question was oh you know and I'm, I'm absolutely shaking so um i've got my list of questions and i'm going to have some journal time for a while which yeah. is <laughs> otherwise my dreams will be bizarre i'm not even sure look one of the things and you mentioned it with regard to the journaling journaling is a great exercise just to release a lot of what's come up so those questions just taking time to actually write them down and thinking about them and then coming back to them and being more mindful from a financial perspective if something comes up what's triggering inside you yeah and i have i i will go back and listen to these questions uh right after we finish and and sit and journal on them yeah in Wonderful. the meantime suzanne where can people find you yeah, so I am at Mindful Finances, so Mindful underscore Finances on Instagram. Otherwise, I'm Mindful Finances on Facebook or Suzanne Alexander on Facebook. And hopefully my webpage will be up in January. So you'll be able to find me at Mindful Finances, which will be fantastic. Amazing. So for those of you listening on audio, you won't be able to see uh, Suzanne Alexander's uh, name. So it's S-U-Z-A-N-N-E. -N -N -E. Alexander is A L E X A N D E R and mindful finances. So, or mindful underscore finances if you're talking about Instagram. So, um, reach out. I will put the, um, the comments in the show notes on the podcast. If you're watching this on the vodcast on YouTube, then it's also available on audio and vice versa. If you're listening to this on audio, then you can go on over to Confidence Through Cabaret YouTube channel and it will be on the vodcast playlist. Suzanne Alexander, I have loved this conversation. And I, I, I said this before we started, I so need this conversation. <laughs> Thank you for that. Thank you. It's been so wonderful to share this time with you. 
Ah, oh, and we'll do this again. I, I, I truly believe in collaboration, and I feel so deeply connected. I, I just, I, I can't wait to do this again. Yay! <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> in the meantime, Suzanne Alexander, Heather Jean, and we are signing off. I am reminding you that it is your body, and it is your world, and it is your stage. Take up space and own it. Thank you for being here. Bye.